Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the evolution of insects, part number two. This episode we continue to talk about the evolutionary history and pathways that insects have taken throughout time. If you are new to my channel and my content, then I would like to gently remind you that you are watching part number two of an online course about the evolution of insects. Therefore, it is recommended that you start with episode number one instead, if you haven't watched it before. Or you are going to miss a lot of context here. You see, in the previous episode, we covered the evolutionary history of insects and their insect-like ancestors. Back to the Ordovician, and we saw the development of giant griffin flies in the Carboniferous 350 million years ago, the evolution on the supercontinent Pangaea in the Permian and the first signs of the evolution of the complete metamorphosis culminating into climate change driven mass extinction into the hot and arid Triassic where after I've recovered we saw the first signs of groups such as wasps and grasshoppers. Of course, me summarizing 480 million years of evolution and a changing environment sounds a bit awkward, but as a summary of everything we discussed in the previous episode, we are now up to date. By the end of the Triassic, things began to break apart. Literally. The supercontinent known as Pangaea began to split and land masses started to drift apart, thus bringing a new age, the Jurassic. During this time period, North America separated from Africa and the Atlantic Ocean began to form. As continental plates drifted away from each other, they slowly ripped apart, triggering massive scale volcanic activity that released enormous volumes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This presumably led to an increase of carbon dioxide, which led to global warming and changes to the oceans, such as acidification, drastic increases in temperature as well. This, once again, led to a global mass extinction. This extinction, also named the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction, caused the majority of species on Earth to once again go extinct. This extinction reminds us of another extinction that we have discussed in part one of the evolution of the insects episode in the late Permian. Interestingly, this extinction happened in less than 10,000 years and happened shortly before the supercontinent Pangaea started to break apart, which is really fast. Interesting to know is that the end Triassic extinction is a matter of considerable debate. Many scientists contend the causes resulting in this mass extinction. I think this is one of the major mass extinctions in the history of time that we perhaps know the least about. Numerous causes from climate change and rising sea levels resulting from the sudden release of large amounts of carbon dioxide two impacts of extraterrestrial objects such as meteorites and factors such as ocean warming, acidification, volcanic activity, seafloor spreading and a lack of oxygen have all been cited. Please note for that uh, we do know for a fact that this extinction uh, occurred. It is not debated that it occurred and it is supported in the fossil record. But what is contended are the main causes that triggered the chain reaction that culminated into the environmental changes that caused this mass extinction, but not the fact it happened in the first place. Early in the Jurassic, the animals and plants were still somewhat the same, but things slowly began to change. As the continents slowly started to drift apart, more coastlines were created allowing oceans to widen and sea levels to rise. The increase in sea levels ultimately led to an increase in humidity. This marks the greatest difference 
between the Triassic and the Jurassic. Slowly the earth transformed from its dry and arid climate into a place where life was thriving. The arid deserts of the Triassic were replaced by lush rainforests. Life thrived and biodiversity skyrocketed. The climate on the land masses of Earth during the Jurassic period was generally like a tropical rainforest with high humidity, warmth and a lot of rainfall. And it is during the Jurassic that we see many new types of fossils cropping up. Such as these here for example. Let me ask you a question, do you recognize them? The broad wings? The eye spots? Aha! Some of you are by now saying, of course, these are surely the fossils of butterflies. Nope! You are totally wrong if you guessed that they were butterflies. They were primitive versions of lace wings or the Neuroptera. Butterflies would evolve much later. And we will surely get to that point later in our presentation. But what is interesting to note is that the Neuroptera or lace wings took almost the same evolutionary pathway as butterflies and moths in the Jurassic. However, it is important to note that flowering plants and thus for example nectar did not yet evolve. Instead, these Neuropterans presumably fed themselves with pollen. What's interesting is that some of them had elongated mouth parts. While there is evidence that some of them had jaws and chewing mouth parts, there was an evolutionary trend towards longer and almost proboscis like mouth parts. Not only that, some even had scales on their wings and eye, spot -like, uh, and eye spots just like butterflies and moths do today. One of the interesting things about nature is that similar designs evolve in similar circumstances. A process called convergent evolution, because when it comes to survival, similar problems require similar solutions. Yes, these were lace wings, not butterflies and moths. Nor did butterflies and moths descend from them. I guess you could say they were nature's first attempt at evolving butterflies but in lace wing form. Should we give them a common name? Butter wings? Lace flies? Butter laces? Never mind. There is evidence that these insects had colorful skills, including disruptive coloration. And they were also daytime flyers, similar to butterflies. So, what about the actual moths and butterflies? Well, the order of Lepidoptera had just begun to evolve. Documentation of early fossil uh, moths stems from around this uh, time period. It was clear that by the Jurassic, the first Lepidopterans were definitely established. Have you ever wondered how butterflies and moths evolved? Well, they actually share an ancestor with one of their closest relatives, the stoneflies or the Trichoptera. The evolutionary event in which the orders of Lepidoptera and Trichoptera diverged and became distinct is well established, but it is also based on a lot of extrapolations. You see, here is the problem. Fossils of Lepidoptera are in general incredibly rare. In this series you are able to observe the beautiful and well-documented fossil records of roaches, dragonflies, beetles, and more, together with me. But in Lepidoptera this is not really possible. The fossil record of Lepidoptera is very lacking in comparison to uh, other orders of winged insects, simply because they do not tend to live in an environment that accommodates fossilization. Their softer body parts are also more rarely conserved after death. Molecular phylogenetic analysis suggests that Lepidoptera diverged from their sister group the Trichoptera or caddisflies somewhere during the Permian or Triassic times. If you've paid attention to the geological time scales in this presentation, we are already in the Jurassic. That means that potentially Lepidopterans evolved much earlier than the time we start finding them um, in the fossil record. 
Unfortunately, methods of age calibration for fossils and the method of age calibration by molecular clocking often provide massive discrepancies. In other words, they provide a very wide range of estimations. Therefore, I am not confident enough to pinpoint the exact moment Lepidopterans evolved. My guess is that the modern forms of Lepidopterans established themselves somewhere on the Triassic to Jurassic boundary from Lepidopteroid ancestors. Now, when I give a class on evolutionary history, I do like to state verified facts from reliable sources of information. However, this time all I can give you is speculation. One thing is for sure, there are confirmed fossil records of Lepidopterans in the Jurassic, which confirms their presence in this time. And from this we can conclude their first appearances were at the very least in the Jurassic, but with a potential to be as early as perhaps the Triassic, or maybe even earlier. This is an online entomology course, not a paleontology, paleontology course. While other interesting forms of life evolved, such as interesting dinosaurs like the stegosaur, forests full of sea cuts and ferns, we must largely ignore these other animals and organisms, because today we really focus on insects. One development that I can mention is the evolution of bird-like lineages of dinosaurs, such as the classic example of the Archaeopteryx, pictured here. Not because I like them, but because this affected insects. Some of these smaller feathered theropod dinosaurs were major groups of insectivores that could not only prey on insects on land, but also in the skies with their newfound abilities to fly, thanks to their feathers. Even today, birds are one of the major predators of insects. This is one of the major reasons that insect body sizes shrank. Often oxygen is blamed for this, but the full picture is much more complex. In fact, during the late Jurassic period, when birds became more agile flyers, the body size of insects decreased, even though the oxygen levels in the atmosphere were increasing. Large insects would have uh, been less maneuverable, especially when taking off from tree branches or the ground, and would be pretty easier prey for birds, with whom they would be also competing for food, but would also be their major predators. In fact, insect size decreased in the late Jurassic period when birds became more agile fly flyers, so and while oxygen was increasing. Now, in the Jurassic, flies or diptera were already established. But what we see happening in this geological time period is the diversification of flies into various new groups. Pictured here is a fossil reconstruction of a pre-angiosperm pollinator, an acrocerid fly with a proboscis twice the size of its body. Fun fact, did you know that some of the relatives of these flies are still alive today? On the bottom right you see, can, can see a picture of an acrocerid fly that is not extinct. Fly fossils are abundant in the late Jurassic. Some new forms were tangle-veined flies, the name Mestrinidae, the Bombillidae or bee flies, the Rachonidae and for example the crane flies or Tipuloidea. Interesting to note is that from this point in the Jurassic and beyond we will not see much more new insect orders arise. After the Jurassic we do see a huge diversification of the insects that currently exist. But all the major orders at this point have already been established. While within these orders we would see new forms and new subgroups, things such as beetles, flies, wasps, dragonflies, the first moths, lacewings, mayflies, grasshoppers, roaches and many more have already come into existence and would simply take on newer forms. So we are this early into the presentation and we still have many more millions of years to go until the present modern times 
but we already see that all the major orders of insects have mostly been established. And although they would change and diversify, it is interesting to see how the foundation is already here. After the Jurassic, we start to enter the Cretaceous. The Cretaceous began about 145 million years ago and it ended 66 million years ago. The most notable about the Cretaceous is the separation of the major continents, some of which are still separated to this day. This was of course a gradual process that took millions of years. And the picture you are looking at right now is the late Cretaceous. The sea levels were higher than any other moment in the history of planet Earth. Because, and because of uh, long shallow continental seas, which flooded parts of the land masses, the surface area of water was very high. The climate was warm and humid. There was a temperature difference between the poles and the equator, although it was much less than today. There were no ice caps around the poles and vast forests were found from the poles to the equator. Life in the Cretaceous was highly interesting and diverse. Many notable forms of life originated during this time, but we will have to ignore them. Since we are approaching this from a paleoentomological perspective, I will only highlight the evolutionary events that had a major impact on the evolution of insects. One of the biggest changes in the evolutionary history of insects is the emergence of flowering plants. Flowers, you see, are the plant's way of striking a deal with insects. In return for a sugary reward, or in this case the nectar, insects would assume the role of pollinators. Before the evolution of flowers, pollinating insects did exist but their relationship with plants was different. Pollen uh, pollinating insects, before the flowers evolved, were likely attracted to plants by edible pollen grains. While they were responsible for transferring pollen between plants, their diet also consisted of the very same pollen, which is more detrimental to the plant. By offering a nectar reward instead, most flower pollinators choose to ignore the pollen in favor of the delicious nectar, making pollination more efficient and beneficial to both organisms. Some of the first pollinating plants were groups related to, for example, lilies, magnolias and laurels. One thing that is important to understand is the difference between angiosperm and gymnosperms. The key difference between angiosperms and gymnosperms is how their seeds are developed. The seeds of angiosperms develop in the ovaries uh, of flowers and are surrounded by a protective fruit. Gymnosperm seeds are usually formed in unisexual cones known as the strobili and the plants they lack fruits and flowers and the seeds are naked. What is interesting to note is that gymnosperms are much more ancient than angiosperms. Angiosperms evolved during the late Cretaceous period about 125 to 100 million years ago. Angiosperms did not evolve from gymnosperms, instead they evolved in parallel with the gymnosperms. Examples of common angiosperms are for example oak trees, eucalyptus or cherry. It is widely accepted that the gymnosperms originated in the, la in the late Carboniferous period, about 319 million years ago, at least 150 million years earlier than the evolution of the gymnosperms. Uh, in, if, later than the evolution of the angiosperms. Oh, sorry guys, I'm a bit confused. Anyway, uh, the flowering plants evolved about 150 million years later than the naked seeded plants. Interestingly, most plants today are the flowering plants or the angiosperms. In terms of evolution, they have outcompeted the gymnosperms, likely because of their cooperation with insects. Angiosperms and their insect pollinators, they form a foundational symbiosis. However, gymnosperms are not extinct, 
and over 1000 species are, are still alive and they include plants such as pine trees, cicads and ferns or ginkgo such as ginkgo biloba and equestrium such as horsetails. And there are some evidences of early insect pollinators such as this roach found preserved in amber. Even to today it's the only roach we have ever found with spongy form mouth parts. Sponging mouth parts are adapted for liquid diets. The roach is also covered in grains of angiosperm pollens. The fossil record of the earliest pollinators is scarce, but several fossils like these exist. The first pollinators of flowers were likely roaches like these, but probably also flies, lepidopterans, neuropterans and more, attracted to the nectar of said flowers. Of course, during the Cretaceous, we also see the first bees. Here, for example, is one of the earliest bee fossils we have found preserved in Cretaceous amber. Melitosphex bermensis, and the fossil has pollen collecting structures on its legs, much like pollen collecting honeybees have today. This suggests the bees collected pollen, much like the modern honeybees. Modern honeybees have a special type of sticky hairs on their legs that they can use to collect and transport pollen, called the pollen basket. And as you can see in some of these pictures here, it's safe to assume our fossilized bees have used them for the same purpose, especially since their appearance coincides with the appearance of flowering plants. During the Cretaceous, we also see the appearance of the first ants. These stunning fossils are some examples of ants preserved in amber from the Cretaceous. Their mandibul mandibular structures were unusual in some instances compared to the modern ants today. Nonetheless, Hymenopterans were on the rise as pollinators and as major predators, such as ants. With the addition of ants, Wasps and bees, the Hymenopterans were on the rise and progression towards their modern, their modern diversity and success. Ah, butterflies. Everybody's favorite insect. Did they evolve in the Cretaceous too? The answer is yes and no. You see, there is a problem. As I mentioned before, the fossil record of Lepidopterans is very scarce. Well, there is niche evidence of clearly preserved bees, cockroaches, ants and beetles preserved in amber and limestone, there are hardly any fossils of moths and butterflies. They fossilize more rarely than any other insect. However, we have modern research methods and one method in particular called molecular clocking. The molecular clock hypothesis states that DNA and protein sequences evolve at a rate that is relatively constant over time and among different organisms. The molecular clock is the name of a technique that uses the mutation rate of biomolecules to deduce the time in prehistory when two or more life forms have diverged. To put it simply, we can analyze the DNA of certain animals to compare, it, to compare them and their differences and more or less calculate how long ago two similar species or groups split from their shared ancestors, based on the presumption that the mutations they accumulated since their evolution are consistent with the presumed time span of these mutations. And based on extrapolations from the DNA of modern butterflies, it is estimated that the most ancient lineages of butterflies that are alive today, for example, the Hesperidae or the Skippers and the Hadelidae or the Hadelid butterflies, diverged in the early Cretaceous, some 90 to 110 million years ago. Now, molecular clocking is a very modern technique and I am pleased to learn humanity has developed such advanced methods of science to look back in time, in ways that were never deemed possible. However, until we have found fossil evidence, I do take this data with a grain of salt. Large discrepancies have been found um, of dates of evolutionary events obtained using the molecular clock. Twofold differences have been reported between the dates estimated from molecular data and uh, those from their fossil record. 
Furthermore, different molecular methods can give different dates that differ 20-fold. Or in other words, molecular clocking is an incredibly new and useful technique but because this technique is so new, it still needs some refinement, because the calibrations are sometimes off. I am not saying we are completely wrong here, but it's important to not place too much, uh, too much uh, confidence in uh, date estimated dates estimated from uh, molecular clocking. The technique is, in my opinion, best used in conjunction with fossil records. That being said, it does make total sense to me that the emergence of butterflies would coincide with the first flowering plants. Even today, these animals have mouth parts that are adapted specifically to feed from flowers and have one of the strongest relationships with flowering plants among all insects. Of course, nectar feeding moths included as well, not just butterflies. In the Cretaceous, we also find some spectacular fossils of stick insects, or the family Phasmatodea. That's right, stick insects were starting to evolve. Some of them already mimicked vegetation, such as leaves and sticks. So their plant-like mimicry evolved later than we previously thought. Interestingly, all the stick insects found in the early Cretaceous had long wings, but by the middle and late Cretaceous, many of them have shorter wings which suggests the shortening of their wings evolved a little bit er, later sorry, in the same geological time period. Were there any dung beetles in the Cretaceous? Well, we have not found direct fossils of them yet, unfortunately, but molecular uh, evidence, the same technique I mentioned before, calibrates the emergence of dung beetles back to the Cretaceous. Yes, yes, ladies and gentlemen, there's a good chance that these animals evolved to feed on dinosaur poop. Think about that the next time you see one. But we are not finished yet. The Cretaceous was also an amazing explosion of insect diversity. Not only dung beetles appeared in the Cretaceous, but also our best friend. Mosquitoes! Yes, that's correct. Our best friend, the insect everybody loves. Now, some of you must be immediately wondering, did the first mosquitoes feed on blood? The answer is probably yes. There is evidence that these first mosquitoes were the Anophelinus, or the relatives of modern malaria-carrying mosquitoes. Not only that, there is evidence that they were um, not only blood feeding, but carried malaria parasites as well. In some blood-drinking midge fossils from the same time, a parasite called the uh, Paleohemoproteus was found fossilized and trapped in the gut of these insects. This parasite was a direct relative of the malaria parasites of the genus Plasmodium that we see today, and that still kill half a million people per year. At the year this presentation was made, malaria, previously thought to have been a relatively modern disease, may have even plagued the dinosaurs. Research on the history of malaria's evolution has revealed that the first vertebrate hosts of the disease may have been reptiles, including dinosaurs. The closer we get to the modern age, the more common fossils become. In the Cretaceous, we find some very interesting forms, such as this fossil of a moth from the Cretaceous. I'm not so sure what group of moths I would place it in, although the shape is reminiscent of a Bomycoidea type of moth. And that was not all. From a reconstruction of fossilized wings from the Cretaceous, we find evidence of our first praying mantids. Praying mantids are closely related to cockroaches and in fact share an ancestor with them. These insects have raptorial forelegs and excellent vision and are a major predator of other insects to this day. We also see some of the first fossilized remains of termites. Termites were formerly placed in the order of the Isoptera, but molecular evidence suggests that they are actually a type of wood-eating roaches. Termites mainly eat cellulose, which is obtained from wood, grasses, leaves, humus, manure, and the manure of herbivorous animals, and other materials of vegetative origin. Interestingly, some very ancient termite fossils have pollen on them. 
This has spawned the theory that some of the first termites could have been pollinators as well. If this is true, I don't know for sure, but it is an interesting theory. Insect life in the Cretaceous was for sure thriving, fascinating and diverse. And our fossil records start to be pretty conclusive. And lions, lacewings, giant water bugs, wasps and bees, and many types of grasshoppers, moths and maybe even butterflies, roaches, mantids, stick insects, termites, mosquitoes. From this point and beyond, nearly all the insect families and orders that you see today were present. Biodiversity was high and life was thriving. What could potentially thwart this? Hmm. The Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event is probably the most famous mass extinction event in the history of Earth. Despite that, if you have been following all the episodes of this online course, you must be aware that by now, life had already been through several mass extinction events. Around 70% of the Earth's animals, including most species of dinosaurs, suddenly died out at the same point in time. An asteroid which was estimated to be at least 15 to 15, uh, 10 to 15 kilometers wide, which is taller than the Mount Everest, hit the Earth with a speed of about 20 times faster than that of a bullet. Contrary to popular belief, it was not the impact of the asteroid alone that led to a mass extinction. Although the asteroid left a crater, which was about 150 kilometers wide, creating huge shockwaves and tsunamis, this should not have caused life to go extinct globally. You see, the asteroid also managed to strike a basin of oil-rich sedimentary rocks, which injected about 1 trillion 542,214,058,000 of fine particle black carbon and dust particles in the atmosphere. The emission of dust and particles could have covered the entire surface of the Earth for several years, possibly a decade, creating a harsh environment for living things. They also lingered in the atmosphere, blocking out the sun. This is what we call an impact winter. Research suggests that a blanket of dust and soot particles may have shrouded the Earth, blocking out the majority of sunlight. This would make it difficult for plants to grow, for example, who need sunlight in order to photosynthesize and to grow. It would also drastically cool the Earth down. This would eliminate about 80% of all the species of animals on planet Earth. The effects of this extinction event on larger animals is well documented. But the question we shall ask ourselves is, what effects did it have on the fauna of the insect kind? Data suggests there was a major extinction of insects worldwide. But most interestingly, Insects around the world were impacted differently. One of the ways scientists could measure this is by looking at the fossils of leaves found after the asteroid hit Earth and look for evidence of insect herbivory. Insects, when they feed on leaves, often leave very typical bite marks or in some cases leaf mines. What's interesting is that we do see a decline in the insect feeding damage but we also see a recovery over time. Even more interestingly is that insect biodiversity took about 4 million years to recover from this extinction in the southern hemisphere, but over 9 million years in the northern hemisphere. In simple terms, it seems that the insect, insect extinction was pretty high in the area where the asteroid hit Earth, but less high on the other side of the world. That means that on the southern hemisphere, it may have acted as a refugia for insect extinction. 
we see a high level of extinction in the southern hemisphere of the planet, but also a fast recovery. In the northern hemisphere, there was a high level of extinction and a slower recovery. The level of extinction was not the same around the globe, and perhaps it was not so bad in some areas far away from the asteroid impact. Despite a huge decrease in biodiversity that lasted millions of years, of the 977 insect families in existence today, nearly 7% are found in the fossil record. An astonishing 85% of the insect families found in amber 100 million years ago still survive today. <clears throat> While this mass extinction event may have had a major impact on the life of many vertebrates and plants, it seems that insects once again were the champions of survival. However, that does not mean that this major extinction event did not impact insects. It did. What we see is not just an extinction, but also a reshuffling. What is a reshuffling? A reshuffling is a rearrangement of the major groups of insects and the way they are represented in the environment. Despite that, a number of insect families changed very little at the end of the Cretaceous. Indeed, insect diversity seems to be a result of their durability rather than their ability to spawn new groups. After the Cretaceous, we enter the Paleogene. In the Paleogene, the climate slowly changed from hot and humid to cooler and more dry. During the Paleogene, the continents continue to drift closer to their current positions and the world map presented here starts to look quite recognizable. This period also marks the rise of mammals and avian dinosaurs. Massive floral shifts gave flowering plants an advantage over the gymnosperms and grasses became dominant over many other plants. Almost all the major groups of butterflies are now present in the fossil record. Nymphalidae, Hesperidae, Papillionidae, Lycaenidae, the Riodinidae and the Pyridae. They seem to have diverged in the Paleogene. Lepidoptera have been around for 200 million years and maybe even more, but their massive diversification did not begin until about 66 to 55 million years ago. About 80% of the butterfly and moth fossil records occur in the Paleogene. The appearance of bats may be another big driver for the evolution of the Lepidoptera. While avian dinosaurs or birds are the major daytime predator, bats are the major nocturnal predator of moths. With their excellent sensory functions and use of echolocations, Lepidopterans had major competition. This is only a small selection of what has been found, but let it be clear that many, many of the modern lineages of moths and butterflies have formed at this point. In the Paleogene we see a huge diversity in the use social insects, particularly Hymenoptera such as bees and ants. Eusociality is described as the social structures in insects. Eusocial animals share the following four characteristics. Adults live in groups, cooperative care of juveniles and the overlap of generations and reproductive division of labor. Use sociality was not a new development in the Paleogene, but what was new was the dominance of it. Social insects start to dominate the fossil record in higher numbers. And even today, social hymenopterans such as wasps, ants and bees are some of the most common and prominent insects in most ecosystems. Another notable phenomenon is the radiance of calyptrat flies. The clad includes some of the most diverse and ecologically important families of flies. The tsetse fly, louse and bat flies, but also house flies and relatives, blow flies, bot flies, flesh flies and their relatives as well. Abundant in most terrestrial ecosystems, calyptrats often play key roles such as decomposers, parasites, parasitoids, vectors of pathogen vectors, and pollinators. Factors that help their success are likely their co-evolution with angiosperm plants and the widespread radiance of mammals for which they acted as parasites or decomposers. Included is uh, the Mesembrinella cyanozonica, 
an early Caleb Trat preserved in amber from the Paleogene. The end. Thank you for watching. See you in the next episode. Bye bye. Hope you learned a lot today. Wait, 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 wait. What? Are you crazy, Bart? What about the Ice Age and the mammals? What about the rise of humans? Would you really skip over the last 23 million years you haven't talked about yet? You see, here's the crazy thing. Modern humans have only been on the rise for 200,000 years and are hominid ancestors for maybe 4 to 6 million years. We, so we tend to think of the past few millions of years as having a major impact. But insects have been around for over 400 million years. And by the time the first humans were even starting to evolve, all major groups of insects were pretty much already there. As someone with a background in biology, it feels weird to construct such a timeline based on fossil records and skip over the last few million years that were the most important for humans. But during this time, not much significant has changed in regards to the evolution of insects. In this presentation, you have seen when dragonflies started to evolve, butterflies, the first beetles, the first of everything, hundreds of millions of years before us. From a paleoentomological perspective, anything from the late Paleogene to today is honestly not that groundbreakingly significant. By the time the first humans were starting to evolve, all modern insects were more or less already there and haven't changed that much. These few million years are shockingly insignificant from the perspective of an insect. If you measured all the time it took for the first hominid ape-like ancestors that started walking on two legs, all the way to modern humans today and their society, and repeat this process and the amount of time it took 100 times, you would just go uh, back just about five slides in this presentation and still the insects around you would look very similar to the ones you see today. Compared to their evolutionary history, we are really just a fart in the wind. Which is why the, these last geological periods are not as significant as we may suspect. Of course, there were a few minor events that may have had an impact on the modern distribution of insects, such as the Ice Age depicted here. Or perhaps Ice Age is inaccurate, since we are talking about eight separate glacialization events happening over a time span of about 750,000 years time, covering much of the continents in ice sheets. Interestingly, these ice sheets did not lead to any major extinction of insects at all, nor did their biodiversity decrease much. Although ice sheets that were covering land masses did affect the distribution of insects, it didn't seem to lead to significant extinction at all. Even the global distribution of some insects that you see today is still defined by the Ice Age or the last glacializations such as the Spanish moon moth, Gaelsia isabella, which is a species that survived the last glacialization events by retreating to one of the refugia in southern Europe. A refugia is more or less a shelter or a locality in which the climate is affected less by climatic changes, such as the glacial cycles of the Ice Age, because the climate is more stable. Here we see in red the distribution of what is assumed to be a very primitive species of moon moth that has been in Europe since before the last Ice Age. Even today, their distribution correlates with the vegetative refugee of pine trees, their host plants in Europe and the local microclimate as well, since they live in cooler, higher altitudes. Have you ever noticed how, many, how so many isolated places have unique versions of similar looking species? One example are atlas moths in each island in the Philippines. Indonesia and Papua, they seem to have unique species on every island. Just like the species of butterflies that you can see in this picture, each of them look like cousins of each other, yet on every group of islands they have their own unique endemic species. Why is that? The answer to that is land bridges. Did you know a land bridge even connected Russia, Europe and America for example? 
the last ice age ended and the land bridges began to disappear in the ocean about 30,000 years ago. Global sea levels rose as the vast continental ice sheets melted, liberating billions of gallons of fresh water. That is why America and Europe still have similar species today, for example. They used to be connected, but over time, when they were separated, populations became isolated from each other and took evolutionary paths of their own, resulting in endemism. More famous examples are the United Kingdom, which was connected to Europe, the island of Taiwan, which was connected to China, or even all the islands in Indonesia that used to have land between them. While this recent event did not really change the course of evolutionary history for insects, it does define some of their speciation and modern distributions today. Despite all of that, it is remarkable that the insect biodiversity remained relatively stable, and the same during the last 20 million years. That's not just my opinion, there are scientific papers and theories supporting this. Actually not much in this presentation was my opinion, and most of the things I have told you are supported by science, including this fact. I am a scientifically literate person, and most of this presentation was based on scientific literature that I have reviewed, although I do subtly, subtly mix my own perspective and personal points of views sometimes to keep it more engaging. Is the story over now? No, we still have the final and very important chapter left. The Anthropocene. There is a new species on the rise. Homo sapiens, the human. It appears that this species is a species that has profound effects on its environment, changing it at a rate that was not thought possible of any species before. How did the rise of humans affect the potential evolution of insects? What would change for them and how did humans impact the course of history? These interesting questions will be answered in our next episode, The Evolution of Insects Part 3, The Anthropocene. In Part 3 we will explore humanity in relation to the evolutionary history of insects and the profound impact we have made on them. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation and learned some new things. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for following my online entomology course. In order to develop this course, I've had to do months and months of reading, researching and studying, writing and more. If you appreciate me and my content, please consider donating, tipping or supporting me financially. I am a demonetized, hardworking small content creator. I believe education and information should be free for everyone, but it's simply not possible to put so much time and effort in a YouTube channel without anything in return. If only 1% of the people watching this support me, the other 99% can enjoy it for free. A win-win situation. My channel is permanently demonetized by YouTube and when people click on my videos and enjoy them, I do not get anything in return. This channel is crowdfunded and the time and effort and resources I need to make videos, I get them directly from my viewers. Without your crowdfunding, this channel and this content would not exist. I use the donations from my viewers to buy books, give me the free time to review scientific publications, write the script and make presentations, and I invest them in my insect breeding programs, since I study several types of insects in captivity and film their life cycles for YouTube, but sometimes also document their life cycles for faunistic research purposes. Investing in me and my content means investing in insects and our knowledge of them and supporting an independent creator that tries to educate the world about the environment and insects. Thank you for watching today. I hope to see you again in the Evolution of Insects Part 3. This was episode part 2. This, uh, the evolution of insects is a part of Bug School, my online entomology course. You could call it part two of episode number two. Find the playlist to find all episodes in chronological order or find them on my channel. I will now display the names of my patrons, the people who help produce this channel. Bye bye.